Hey everybody, welcome back to the Renaissance Woodworker. I am Shannon Rogers, your host, and today I'm gonna to be cutting a tapered sliding dovetail. And certainly the aim of this is to show you how to lay out and how to cut one of these, but my greater aim for this video, as well as a few in the future, is to talk specifically about chisel skills. I get questions from a lot of people about how would I do this technique or this technique, and they're kind of slightly out of the normal techniques and people can't think of a plane that will allow them to do that. And I'm often surprised that no one thinks of just using a chisel. The chisel is really the, the, like the first woodworking tool. Hand planes are just chisels set at an angle. Saws are just a whole bunch of tiny chisels lined up in a row. The chisel is the most powerful woodworking tool. It has no limits. It doesn't care about angles. It doesn't care about reach, capacity, any of that stuff. It can do pretty much anything. Now this is not a minimalist woodworking type thing. Build something with only two tools, you know, or use only the basic tools, because then we'd be talking about why not you just sharpen a stone and go from there. I like to use specialty planes. I like to use specialty saws. I like specialty tools in general. If it makes the work more efficient, I'm all for it. But here's the thing. People so often are focused on a tool that's specialized to help you do this one task that they forget that they already have a tool that can do that task right there in their tool cabinet. The chisel will do it. And here's the thing. If you embrace mastering your chisel skills, get comfortable using a chisel, get comfortable essentially freehanding work, because that's really what chisel work is, and that's also why it scares people, this is going to make you an imminently better woodworker. You're gonna run into those unusual situations, inside corners, sliding dovetails, you know, uh, uh, moldings around corners, and you wonder, how am I gonna do this? Look no further than the chisel. And if you've spent some time honing those skills and getting more comfortable handling a chisel and using a chisel, using it bevel up, bevel down, in a variety of situations, there is absolutely no project, no task that you can't accomplish. So yes, sliding dovetails can be done using something like a dovetail plane. I've even got one. But you know what's funny? When it comes to the tapered sliding dovetail, I don't use my dovetail plane. This is enough of a twist on the dovetail joint that really the most efficient way is using a chisel. Now I've heard on some podcasts lately, you know who I'm talking about, that you have to have a dovetail plane to make a sliding dovetail. Not true, and I'm gonna show you how to do it right now. Just a quick overview of the joint. Obviously, we have a dovetail shaped on the bottom. The dovetail allows these boards to interlock together. The sliding dovetail allows you to run the tail across the board in a cross grain situation. By fitting these two together, this board is allowed to expand and contract. You don't glue it, or if you do, you glue just like the first inch or two of it and you allow the rest of it free to expand and contract. Because we have a dovetail shape here, it locks the pieces together. More often than not, these can be quite tight as well and really don't need any glue at all. But the tapered sliding dovetail is because things get really tight and a heck of a lot of friction builds up. And you can imagine, I mean, this is just a six inch wide board. If you had something like an 18 or 24 inch case side, the amount of surface area that's involved here and the precision required to create this joint would create so much tension that a lot of times it can be very difficult to put together. The taper tapers to the back, so it's narrow at the back, and the tail itself is narrow at the back. It's not much, but the beauty of this is, is it allows this piece to come together and you know it's sliding real easily, and it doesn't start to come tight until about one inch is left. And from here, the whole thing really cinches up tight. And by the way, here's a little trick that I do with the tapered dovetail. I will often leave the socket board a little bit wide. So then once I get a really snug fit, I can come back and actually plane this flush. You can see 
how this is really tight now. It's pulled up tight, but it's a little bit recessed of the surface. Certainly you can have it come up perfect or have the tailboard be a little bit fat and plain that. I just find that uh, leaving one, either the tail or the socket board, a little bit wide of finished dimensions really ensures you get a nice flush fit on the front. But you can see I've got a super, super tight joint here and I didn't have to muscle with that tight fit all the way across the length. Moreover, taking it apart, Once I kind of break that loose, now it slides apart real easily. So you might look at this and go, man, that's super complicated. But honestly, there's not that much to it. This is tapered on both sides. So if you look at this pin board or socket board, you can see how the whole socket tapers on both sides here. A lot of people will tell you to leave one side square and only taper the top side. I would absolutely recommend that you follow that. Taper only one side and leave the bottom side of that shelf or that drawer blade flat or square across the piece. This really allows you to get the spacing of your drawers or whatever those elements are exact. Once you start tapering both sides, you run the risk of slightly skewing the shelf or maybe messing up the spacing in between. But making that bottom edge nice and square just stacks the cards in your favor. And the wedge, the dovetailed action of the top and the, the tapered action, it still acts exactly the same way. And it's a little bit less work. Now, as you can see, this tapers in both directions. To do this, I rely upon a center line and you can look at my tailboard and you can see I've still got a center line all the way down the middle, center line on both edges, and I was able to measure off that center line to create a consistent taper on both sides. What I'm gonna show you today is really the more standard. And when I use this in a piece of furniture, I generally only taper that one side. It's just a lot less work with really the same strength and same result. I've got just two pieces of scrap pine lying around. They're probably, what, five inches long. Traditionally, when you're gonna use a sliding dovetail, it's because you've got a wide board and a cross grain situation and the, the sliding dovetail fixes that cross grain conflict. It's nothing to say you couldn't use it on a smaller piece like this, but traditionally they're much wider. But for demonstration purposes and just for the sake of time, I'm gonna use a narrow piece like this. I've got my two boards. Um, I'm gonna need a crosscut back saw and I have a fence that I've created that has a 15 degree angle cut on one side. This is the same fence I use for all of my sliding dovetails. And I actually have a video, actually a live demonstration I did on making sliding dovetails where you see this fence used as well. So if you're looking for just standard untapered sliding dovetails, you wanna check that video out. Still, I'm gonna use this fence for the uh, tapered version as well. I am gonna use my router plane for cleaning out the floor of this. There's nothing that says that I can't use the chisel for that as well. But here again, this is not about, you know, oh, I'm just gonna use a chisel. I'm just gonna use only the basic tools and go with a minimalist approach. If that's what you wanna do, that's great. In this particular instance, the router plane will be the most efficient way to clean out the floor and the most accurate way, or I should say the most precise way to get a consistent floor. So I'm gonna use that and that's it, really, that's all I need. Well, chisel, of course. First things first, this is my tailboard. And I guess technically we should call this the socket board, but just out of habit, I call it a pin board because it's tails and pins, right? This will be the female part of the joint. This will be the male part of the joint. So I want to first determine how deep the socket's gonna be. And frankly, I just shoot for about half, maybe a little bit more than half the thickness. So just kind of eyeball that. And I'm gonna make a baseline mark right in the middle of my socket board on both edges. Next, I'll take that exact same mark and I will mark out the baseline for the tail. Nice deep scribe line, because I will be sawing along both of these scribe lines. So the deeper you can make it, the more you can come in with a chisel and make that kind of saw cut, first class saw cut notch, if you will. Now I need to figure out the extents of the socket. And ideally what I want is the tail, the wide part of the tail, to be as wide as the thickness of the board. 
and then it narrows down to a, a narrow neck in the inside. The reason that I want it to be as wide as the board is thick is that gives me the maximum dimension to taper down and keeps the neck wider. Again, the neck would be that narrow part of the tail right at the baseline. If I bring my lines in and I make the wide part of the tail you know, narrower than the actual thickness of the board, then I end up with an even skinnier neck on the, the tail. And that's really gonna be the weak part of the entire joint. I wanna maximize the thickness there to provide the greatest strength. So if my tail at its widest point is as wide as the thickness of the tail board, that will give me the maximum extents of my socket. So I just line it up. And obviously if I had an exact location where there would be, I would line this up. But I, what I wanna do is using a pencil, capture the thickness. So now I've got two lines on the edge of the board right over on my baseline that tell me this is how wide the socket is at its maximum point. In other words, down here at the baseline where the widest point of the tail is, is where I want that socket to be. So now I can use a dovetail marker to set my angles. Now, as I said, my dovetail fence, my sliding dovetails have always used a 15 degree angle. I have a, a dovetail marker that I made that is a 15 degree angle. So if you already have a dovetail marker that's one in six or one in eight or whatever that is, you wanna make your fence match that. Um, I made this as a project on actually sliding dovetails. If you look close, that's a sliding dovetail. I made this as a project in the hand tool school and I specifically set it at 15 degrees because I like that larger splay. I think it kind of looks cooler and it gives me a little bit more bite, I think, in a sliding dovetail. As far as what angle you need to, you need to choose, I really don't think it matters. You know, 14 degrees, 12 degrees, 13.4 degrees, 3.14 degrees if you like pie. Um, it doesn't really matter as long as your gauge matches your sawing fence. So now that I know the maximum dimension, I can line up my gauge, put my pencil in my um, baseline. Here is the baseline that I struck in with a knife. I put my pencil in that junction and I can mark the shape of the socket. So now there is my socket laid out. And now where the narrow part or the neck of the tail intersects the face, I'm gonna make just a little tick mark, those carry those lines over. And now I can use a square and a knife to run those lines back across the face. And this tells me where I'm going to saw. Flip it around because I want to try to keep the bevel side of my marking knife here into the waist towards the inside. If I flip to the other side, I could end up with a socket that's a little bit wider. Probably a little too precise for this, but it doesn't hurt to be extra careful. So now with the lines knifed across, now I've located the neck on the opposite side of the board, which means I can now come back with my pencil, or you can use a knife if you want. Um, a pencil is perfectly fine. Drop the pencil in that point, where the knife line comes across, whoops, I almost did it backwards. <laughs> Make sure you're marking that angle down. Flip that gauge around. And now I've laid out the socket all the way across my pin board. Now at this point you're going, I thought you were making a tapered sliding dovetail. I am. What I just showed you was the layout for an untapered dovetail. But honestly, I find that laying out the untapered socket, two square lines, gives you kind of a baseline to work from. It turns this variable joint, this angled joint, into kind of a constant. It gives you a good place to start from. So I now add the, uh, the taper from the squared lines that I've already started with. 
You don't have to do this. I just find that it's kind of a gut check and it makes laying out the taper a little bit easier. So now I'm going to create that offset. So let's just go ahead and mark this, the, the front of my piece. This will be the widest part. I'm gonna grab a ruler. Actually, I don't even really need a ruler. I'm just gonna grab an arbitrary amount here and let's come in maybe an eighth, maybe a little more than an eighth at the back. This doesn't have to be much. If I were doing a 24 inch wide case, I would probably only run that taper a quarter of an inch. Because again, the more you move this taper in, the narrower the neck on the tailboard is gonna be and the more fragile it will end up being. So it's a very, very small taper. And now I can drop my knife in the knife line up here, run my, my straight edge up to it and line it up on my tick mark. Start with a nice light cut here because you don't want to shift the ruler around. And now I have the new taper line and I can now locate the new angled line. So yes, this kind of doubles the work and I've got this separate line here. Technically, if I were making this a showpiece, I probably wouldn't want to do that, but there's also every chance that the shoulder of the tailboard is going to cover that up. In fact, we know it will because this line is inside the maximum thickness of the board. So I strike that first line just to kind of level set things. It gets everything nice and square. It adds a kind of a, a constant or a level of precision. And then I create the taper from that. You don't have to do that. You could create the taper right away, but I find it's a little bit harder to locate and set up your angles and everything when you don't have the, the square line set up first. So now I'm gonna cut the socket, but I'm gonna start with the chisel and cutting in my first class saw cut or called a knife wall, I suppose. Some people call it a knife wall, whatever you call it. It's particularly useful here because it will help register your saw and the fence that we're gonna saw against. Grab a hold fast, grab your sawing fence, take the angled side in, and I'm gonna grab my tailboard for a little bit of support for the fence back here, and I do want an ancillary clamp. So first things first, I will take my saw and I will drop it into that knife wall I created. And this is why you want a nice deep knife line so that it actually registers cleanly in place. Now I slide the fence right up against it. That registers the fence where I want it. And this is why I've got this kind of other board behind it. Give me two points of clamping pressure. I just want to come back and double check that everything's lined up, especially when you, when you sink the hold fast, when you set the hold fast, sometimes the fence can shift. Everything's still in place. Give it another whack just to be certain everything's not going to move. And I'm now set up on the angled side of the dovetail. Hit my base lines. So now I can pop off my fence and repeat this cut on the other side.
double check everything and I am dead spot on my lines on both sides. And that's the beauty of uh, using that sawing fence. Now before I put the saw away, the last thing I'll do is I drop a saw cut right down the middle of the waist. I've heard this referred to as a Morton cut. <laughs> it's gonna make chiseling out the waist easier, but also in some respects actually possible. Because we have a dovetail shaped joint here, the waist is wider at the bottom and it will wedge in place as you try to chop it out. So throwing that saw carf in there gives you kind of a pressure valve to allow you to chisel things out. Now we can have a little bit of fun and use the chisel to pop out the waist. Get about halfway into the board, I flip the chisel, bevel down, and I'll take it as close, you know, maybe half an inch from the edge. I don't wanna go all the way over because I risk blowing everything out. Now I'm gonna go a little bit deeper. That took about half the waist out. But you can see how that Morton cut down the middle makes everything come out so much easier. It also makes kind of a handy little depth stop. As long as I can still see my saw curve and I stop my saw curve right at my baseline, as long as I can still see my saw curve, I know that I haven't gone too far. So it gives me a, a gut check, if you will, as I'm chopping. That's about as far as I wanna go there. Flip it around, finish it from the other side. Here is one opportunity if you have a crank neck chisel that can be just fantastic because you can come in here and work either by hand or with a mallet all the way across the joint. And it gives you, it really will pick out the high spots because you're using that single blade and it makes it real easy to clean this up. So that's one way, if you didn't have a router plane, you can just use the chisel. Technically, I don't need to use a crank neck. I can use a regular chisel beveled down, but you'll find um, that takes a little bit more finesse. But here is a skill that is fantastic to learn. And we'll talk about this in some future videos on how to actually get a nice flat bottom riding the bevel using the chisel bevel down. But this is far enough for now. I'm gonna grab my router plane and finish this up to depth. Be careful with your router plane that you don't mar these top edges. These are pretty delicate, rather sharp too. They'll also cut you if you're not careful. Every time you lift the router plane out, you have a potential to ding that edge a little. So just be a little cautious, especially on the tapered side. It's also a reminder that the router plane is not a heavy removal tool, it's a refinement tool. So if you chickened out with your chiseling and you stayed well away from your line, you've got that much more delicate router plane work to do. But if you use your chisel and practice your chisel skills and got real close to your line, that's all the work I have to do. I have just removed that saw curve from that Morton cut and I'm right at my baseline. I could stand to go like a hair more. Well, <laughs> maybe not that little of a hair. But that now has my socket and you can see there's my taper. There's my original line and there's the taper. So it's a subtle taper but it's a taper nonetheless. I already got the baselines marked out on my tailboard. So I did use a chisel and I chiseled in that first class saw notch all the way around because I will be sawing out the shoulders. I then used my same dovetail guide and laid in my tails. Again, setting the wide part of the tail right at the corner, right at the maximum width of the board. I laid that in and I actually laid it on both ends, just like I did for the socket. Lay it out perfectly square. Now. I've marked the front side of this or the wider part of the joint and you want to bring it down to the socket you've already cut and kind of get your bearing. So when I set this in place, lining up front and front, I can see here is the taper. 
This is the flat side, so I won't be touching this side. I won't be tapering this side, but I will be tapering this side of the joint. So I'm just going to go ahead and be obvious and write taper right there on that side of the joint. So I'm going to look up here, and here again is why I like to mark the socket square across and then add the taper because that square line is still highly visible here and I can use that to very easily measure what my offset actually is. Now let me be clear here. I am not a big measurer. Don't believe in measuring. I believe in relative dimensioning. But what I want to do is just get in the ballpark. And when I hold this up at the maximum taper, I can see that my taper is just over a sixteenth of an inch, probably about three thirty seconds of an inch. What I want to do is actually round down. In other words, make it wider. So since it's larger than a sixteenth of an inch, if I mark my tailboard with the taper that's exactly a sixteenth of an inch, that means the narrow section will actually end up being wider than the actual socket. And that's what I want. I want the fit to be snug because I can always pair and remove a little wood to fine tune the fit. So I'm just measuring to give me a ballpark number, not to get an exact number because I likely screw it up when I transfer it. So round down and come to the nearest mark on, on your line. You don't want to you know, round down too far because then you've got a whole bunch of material to remove. But I'm essentially rounding down about a 32nd of an inch here. I clamp my tailboard so that it's nice and firm and won't wiggle on me. And I can see I wrote taper right here. This is where I want to offset the board by a sixteenth of an inch. So I'm going to bring my ruler, line it up with the edge, and come down and make a mark in a sixteenth of an inch. So now connecting corner to corner. I now have my taper laid in. And you may not even be able to see it on the camera. It is subtle. It should be subtle. It shouldn't be a massive taper. Again, I want to maximize the neck of the tail. So here I can come down and now I can draw in my new tail line. Let me just draw my baseline in. So now I've got the profile of my tail on the narrow end and the profile of my tail on the wide end all laid out and I'm ready to start cutting. That first class saw cut comes in real handy here. This is the untapered side. And it is not a deep cut. That's all I got to do, but that's just enough to break up those fibers. So now I'm flipping a board over and I'm putting the taper side towards me. That's the side I want to see clearly. And I'll come in, start my cut, just working real shallow. be right at my line. Another pass or two. Okay, I'm cut there, so now I need to go just a little bit deeper on this end. Purposely kind of angling the handle down. And once I feel like I'm there, I actually press the plate into the wood and you can feel if there's any high spots in the middle, if the saw plate is rocking, that registers firmly. I'm at my lines on the tapered side and on the untapered side. And that's all the sawing I have to do here. So this is where some would say you would need a dovetail plane. A dovetail plane is really a moving filister. It's got a movable fence on the bottom, but the sole is set at an angle. And this angle happens to match the angle we've been cutting everything at at 15 degrees. It's got a skewed blade, so it cuts nicely across the grain. It's got a depth stop. This is it. But here's the thing. When you use a plane, you're covering up 
the wood. You can't actually see where you're cutting. Now, on a short piece like this, it really makes no sense to use a plane. If this were a 24 inch long tail, it might make more sense to use a plane. But here again, because as I'm cutting, I can't actually see where I'm cutting. And because I've got to create a taper, I, I really want to be able to see where I'm working. I want to be able to see my layout lines. And the one tool that offers ultimate visibility while you're working is the chisel. I can see exactly where I'm cutting, exactly how close I am to my line. And this is where I find adding the taper here is an extra level of complexity that makes the dovetail plane not the most effective tool. The chisel wins hands down, both from an efficiency perspective and from an accuracy perspective. So lecture aside, I'm going to start on the untapered side. And you'll notice again, that's why I wrote taper on there. I don't see that, which tells me this is the untapered side. I'm going to first start kind of grossly or roughly. I'm gonna come about halfway in from the edge and I'm just chopping. I'm seeing my, my angle, my, my layout here, trying to mirror that, but really I'm just trying to hog out waste. Working down to the neck of the tail. And because I've sawn that, you notice the chips just come right out. The saw cut frees everything. So now I am like 95%, 98% of the way to my tail. From here, I can come back and pair it into shape along the grain. Here again is where something like a crank neck chisel can be really beneficial. I will start on one end and essentially use my layout lines and pair across the grain. That's the weakest direction of the wood. It's the least force required. And I can essentially shape the angle exactly. I'll come back on the opposite end and do the same thing. I like to set it in the saw cut, and kind of pair my way across, pivot it back into place, and I can very easily shape that angle. I don't know why I'm still using my crank neck chisel, it's not necessary here. And now I've got the angle set there. So from this point and this point out, that's the angle that I want. I've got a starting and end point, and I just need to match that with the chisel the rest of the way. So actually, what's fantastic here is having a nice wide chisel. I can set the chisel in the section that I've already planed to the angle and pivot it into the cut. That matches the angle of the tail and allows me to very quickly shape it the rest of the way. Got a few bumps and bumps right there. This is where, again, a pairing uh, crank neck chisel can be nice because I can kind of come across and pick up any high spots. That is now shaped on that side. Flip it over and repeat it on the other side. But here again, there's my word taper. This is the tapered side of the joint. So I have to be a little bit more careful of what I'm doing. I'm gonna still start by kind of roughing in the shape, chiseling down to my baseline. And remember, my cut actually goes deeper on this side. So I'm gonna come down and look at my layout line and I've got more wood to remove on this side. And just by eye, I can, you know, slight raising and lowering of the handle. I can almost exactly match that angle very quickly. 
And because I've got a line on the ingrain that shows the taper, I can also very quickly see if I'm matching the taper. Using that same pivot technique, but now I'm going to look at the line on the ingrain that shows my taper. And here again, ultimate visibility. I can see exactly where I'm cutting. That tail is shaped. I've got a little bit more material to remove down here. So again, drop it, drop the back end. It's matching the angle. Just pivoting cuts. And check your pencil line. If you can still see some pencil line, you've got a little bit more to remove. Now remember, that pencil line denotes a taper that's actually, in our case, about a 32nd of an inch wider than the socket. So if I leave the pencil line, I'm certainly going to be too wide of a fit. If I remove the pencil line, I'm probably about right. But here's also the brilliance of the tapered sliding dovetail. If I am too wide on the narrow end here, it just means that the tailboard won't seat all the way. And if you remember when I showed the example joint at the beginning here, I said that I like to leave my boards wide. If you purposely leave this board a half inch wide, a quarter inch wide, I've got the ability to refine the fit of this joint, get it seated exactly the way I want it, and then I can trim the width of the socket board or the tail board in order to get everything matching up nice and flush. So there is a, a lot of room, wiggle room here, just unifying any facets I've created, and that is done. So I've got a clear tail on that side and that side. I'm right to my layout lines on both sides. And there's certainly, especially when you look at the shoulder, you can certainly see the taper. That shoulder is fatter than this one up there, but it's still relatively subtle. Now the real proof in all this is how does it fit? So here's the front, here's the front. If you slide together and you can see nice and smooth, no resistance. Now the resistance is starting to creep up. I'm past the halfway point, but it's starting to get tight and it's a little too tight for this point. I still got maybe a quarter of the board to go. Now I could probably hammer this home and it might be okay, but that's not really the point of this joint. We want it to slide together a lot easier. I really don't like it to start to come hammer tight until I'm about an inch, maybe an inch and a half from the edge of the board. So, you know, just for fun, let's just say we want it to come tight right around there and then I can hammer the rest of it home. So what I'm going to do, and we should, we should actually expect this because I know that I left this taper fatter than the actual socket. So I'm going to come back to my bench hook. Let's just lock this in place and I'm just going to pare away a little bit more wood. And be careful you don't blow out the edge like I just did. I wasn't thinking it just blew right off the edge. But here again, if I left this board wide, I can just plane off any spelching I may have gotten. Is that a 32nd of an inch? I don't know. Doesn't really matter because we've got so much flexibility with this joint and it comes up tight right at my pencil line, which tells me now that my friends is a tight joint. It is completely tight on the front. That's a pencil line. It's not a gap. And look at that. It is tight on the back. There's that little bit of spelching I got from being too aggressive with the chisel. 
but this is so unbelievably rock solid. And guess what? Even though I said that I wanted to leave it long, so I allow for that, you know, wiggle room, I could have gone more on the taper. I could have actually loosened this fit even more and had this come up tight, you know, an eighth of an inch recessed and clean it all up or vice versa. It could have come tight earlier and this would have been, you know, recessed or maybe a little proud, clean all that up and you get a perfect joint. But, you know, if you follow the layout lines and you work right to your layout line, ta-da, I end up with a joint that's perfectly flush and super tight on both faces. So I'm not gonna pretend that you can't cut this joint if you do have a dovetail plane, but obviously you don't need it. And for something this scale and for something with this taper, I definitely wouldn't wanna use that dovetail plane. This is not about use as few tools as possible. Use as basic a tool as possible. Be minimalist in your approach. Heck no, I, I don't wanna espouse that. What I do want you to take away from is the chisel is ridiculously powerful. Everything you saw me do for cutting this tail was essentially done freehand. Just a chisel and working to a line. Honing your ability to use a chisel and remove wood right back to a line can give you a joint that fits as precisely as what we have here with as much stuff going on. We've got tail angles and socket angles and taper angles and square angles and all kinds of stuff, but it's all just lines that you need to work back to. You hit those lines, you hit your joint and it can be done, I feel, more efficiently and more accurately when I can see what I'm doing by using just a chisel.